Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21, states that if a son is stubborn and rebellious and won't listen to his parents, even though they chasten him, then the parents are to lay hold on him and bring him out to the elders of the city and declare their son to be stubborn and rebellious and tack on that he is also a drunkard and a glutton. Then all the men in the city are to stone the boy to death so that evil will be put away and all Israel will hear about it in fear. <laughs> yeah, I reckon all Israel would indeed hear in fear. I for sure would fear if I heard about such behavior today. And I'm not sure how this boy got to be a drunkard and a glutton just because he didn't obey his parents, but whatever. The Bible says that if you obey your parents, life will go well for you and you'll live longer. Well, sure, because you won't get stoned. I mean, what else could that mean? We all know that obey, obeying parents doesn't give you a long life. Little children die when they aren't even old enough to obey. Of course, if your parents tell you not to run out into the street and you do anyway, then you might die. But obedience to parents is not a surefire way of living a long life. I mentioned this passage about the stoning of rebellious sons in a previous video. And a commenter stated that I had missed the part that explains that this was a court procedure. The boy was supposedly tried and found guilty. Well, I don't see that in the passage, but it doesn't matter. Of what was he found guilty? His parents said he drank too much and ate too much. We don't know for sure that this claim is even true. What we know is that the boy didn't, didn't do what his parents told him to do. I don't see a crime in there, even if the young man was a drunk and a glutton. And I most definitely see nothing worthy of death. Seriously, do y'all see a behavior worthy of death in that account? If we killed all the teenagers who sneak out of the house or don't clean their rooms when told to or, or fail to take out the garbage on time or eat too much pizza or get drunk from time to time, how many teens would make it to adulthood? These are not hanging crimes or, or crimes at all. And they shouldn't be stoning crimes either. This is outrageous treatment of young people. This is a heinous law. It's heinous. And the God of the Bible authorized it. But the ancient Israelites put their God above their children. We know that, uh, of course, from the story of Abraham and Abraham's willingness to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice to Yahweh. But the truth is, these people put their priests and prophets above their children because, for the most part, they were simply following the words of these men who were set up to be their leaders. And today, Christians put the church and its leaders above their children. Yes, they think they're putting Jesus before their children, which they're told to do, but Jesus isn't here. All we see is his body. His head's up there somewhere in the clouds. He said he had to leave in order for the Spirit to come. So perhaps the Spirit would have to leave for Jesus to come back. The Spirit and Jesus probably don't want to leave crazy old Yahweh on his own or tell him what kind of chaos he would create. Somebody needs to make sure he doesn't blow us all up. I understand that all three of the gods in this trinity of gods are supposed to be here, there, and everywhere. But according to the words of Jesus, that is not true. He said he was leaving here and going there because the Spirit couldn't come here if he didn't go there. Here and there are two different places. But back to parents and their children. The fact is that parents can't even be a part of the body of Jesus if they don't put the body first. Being the bride of Jesus, the body is attached to his head. So the body, or church, is the most important thing in the world to Christians. They live their lives in service to the church. The body is all that acts in this world to reflect the will of Jesus. So service to the church is service to Jesus. And Christians expect their children to have the same view they do. So when their children are young, 
They forced the children to go along with their worship of, of this man Jesus, who stated that he was not a god when he said he was the son of man, just like the rest of us are. And the Bible clearly states that God is not a man nor the son of man. It, <clears throat> if a seven-year-old gets out of bed one Sunday morning and declares that he has read the Bible and decided it doesn't resonate with him, that he doesn't believe it is good, nor does he believe it's from a God. He is forced to go to church anyway because he's too young to make a decision like that. However, if the same child gets up and says he has decided to follow Jesus and commit his life to being a slave to Jesus, his parents rejoice and hug him and call their family and friends to come to his baptism. He's used his maturity and intelligence to make a wonderful decision for his life. He's old enough to commit his entire life to Jesus, to be faithful to Jesus even to death, but somehow not old enough to reject Jesus. Once children of Christians are grown, they are expected to have already become a Christian and committed their lives to Jesus. Some parents groom them to become preachers and pastors. I've heard Christians say that there is no higher office in the world than that of a pastor. So it's a huge feather in the cap of a parent who produces a pastor. The truth is, parents don't just have to put the church before their children. They have to hate their children. If children refuse to follow in their parents' footsteps and instead reject their parents' faith, the parents sometimes refuse to have a relationship with them. That's particularly true if the child was once a Christian, but then turned her back on Jesus. After all, the Bible does say that backslidden Christians are to be shunned. This might even happen if the adult child chooses a different brand of Christianity than the parent adheres to. Christian parents sometimes disown their children. That's especially true if the children proclaim themselves to be atheists or gay or trans. All of this is bad enough, but Christians even put individual, men, individual members of the church before their children. If some preacher or other member of the church sexually molests their infant child, parents sweep it under the rug. They don't turn the person into the police, and the perpetrator is not removed from the church. Naturally, he either denies the allegations or he repents and asks for forgiveness, and the parents are then obligated to forgive him and keep the whole thing quiet. If the person is brought to justice, it's generally because the child reveals what happened once she's grown. And of course, there are usually others who have also been molested by the same person, and they might come forward too. The man or woman might come to justice years later, but because the parents refused to take action, he has been allowed to continue to hurt children for years. Because both the parents and the church allow the person to get away with this atrocious, atrocious behavior, causing great harm to children, they are also responsible and accountable for his actions. They, too, are abusers and pedophiles and criminals. And by the way, I think that if it is discovered that the church or a parent has harbored such a person and failed to report any incidents of abuse that they know about, they should be held liable in a court of law along with the abuser. Now, the church doesn't hide the abuse of children because they love the molester or rapist. I mean, it's possible they do, of course. For instance, it might be that the molester slash rapist is the beloved preacher whom many adore and nobody can bear to ruin his reputation or cause problems for him. Maybe he's popular makes a lot of converts, or brings in a lot of seat warmers. Or perhaps he's rich and puts a lot of money in the collection plate. But usually the reason nothing is done is presented as noble. You know, to turn him in would be to harm the church, the body of Christ, the pillar and ground of truth. 
It would bring shame and cause a blight on the glorious bride of Christ if the news of this heinous behavior were leaked to the evil people of the world. You know, those people who are more evil than child molesters and rapists. The church sometimes might fire the preacher. They probably don't call it that. And the story told about his departure is usually that he feels that he has given all he has to offer to this particular group of people. And churches need fresh voices from time to time. So he is allowed to move on to another unsuspecting church with a glowing recommendation. Recommendation. I've been a part of churches when a preacher's had an affair with one of the members of the congregation. A preacher's been caught using illicit drugs. And a preacher's simply just not been intelligent enough to be in the pulpit. And in every instance, the man was sent on without so much as a warning to other churches. And understand that this bizarre and unjustified loyalty is all for a God man who might not exist. Nobody living today has any proof that Jesus was ever born, let alone that he was or is a God. A lot of contradictory documents talk about him, and hundreds of years later, <clears throat> he's a, after he supposedly lived, some political and religious leaders got together and combed through some documents, discarding the ones they didn't like, and told the world that the ones they chose came straight from the mouth of God. And of course, over the years, documents were discarded and brought back in until these fallible humans finally decided on the perfect canon. And speaking of nobody's having seen Jesus in our day, and also relating back to Jesus having to leave so the spirit or comforter could come, I recently read an article stating that if Jesus hadn't left earth, there would be proof and no opportunity to, to believe by faith because people could just go check it out. Well, we can't have that now, can we? I mean, if we had evidence that Jesus existed, too many people might make it to heaven. We know that Yahweh doesn't want intelligent people in heaven. Intelligent people would be smarter than dumb old Yahweh. <laughs> intelligent people are logical. They see through Yahweh's ridiculous claims. Yahweh wants the simple-minded. He wants gullible people who will follow along blindly without thinking too much. You know, people like faithful Abraham, who was willing to murder his own son for this monster. Seriously, the Bible says this. He doesn't even call many wise, mighty, or noble people. That's 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. And if he doesn't call you, you can't come. Actually, wouldn't it be great if we really could check the Jesus story out? One would think a God who desired to save us would provide evidence of himself. And isn't it interesting that the person who said it would be a bad thing if we had evidence is admitting that indeed we have no proof that Jesus ever lived, lived or was the Son of a God. Besides, the people who supposedly saw Jesus, how were they able to have faith? Wasn't faith important to them? Or is it important only for us? The stupidity, stupidity of this man's comment hurts my head. Regarding Jesus, even if the man is real, and even if he's a God, as I've said before, Christians are not married to him yet, unless they're preterists. They're simply engaging in an illicit relationship with him. They're fornicating with Jesus. So in reality, they put their boyfriend above their children. Pretty disgusting, huh? We are appalled when a mother allows a boyfriend to abuse her children. But it's fine if Jesus or one of his followers does it. And you know what's ironic about all of this? John the Baptist was supposed to come and turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. Lest this Jesus come and smite the earth with a curse or a hex. Instead, these fathers who, by the way, are in a gay relationship with Jesus, have turned their backs on their children in order to be slaves to an overlord 
that they aren't even sure exists. If you ask me, that right there is cursed or cursed, meaning villainous, disgusting, abominable, atrocious, devilish, fiendish, loathsome, odious, pernicious, and vile. But, hey, that's Christianity for you. Thank you for watching. Thanks to my patrons and my subscribers and my commenters. Bye.